Yeah. So let us start with it. So if you look at the subheading, so I so so one of the things I always focus on is so there is a talk name. So normally you say it's an introduction or it's something, but the subheading normally tells you what the talk is all about. So it's like a movie, right? So when you see a movie, if you have a very catchy subheading, then you kind of understand what is the movie is all about. Because name is sometimes you don't get the name you like, right? So maybe someone else is registered, all the movies already came. Now you can come up with a subheading. So I was thinking, what is the subheading? So the subheading I came up with is, it's the next generation streaming API for Spark. So Spark had streaming earlier also. It's not like it's a kind of a new addition to the Spark. But it's a next generation streaming API, which means they are rethinking what exactly streaming means in Spark using structure streaming. So that's what we are going to explore today, why they are doing it and what are the implications of that. And also, if you look at this, so I'm calling this an introduction to structure streaming. The reason is that the structure streaming is a huge API. It's not a small thing. It's not like a small API getting added. So I am not able to cover everything in this talk. So there are going to be talks in the future meetups where we'll pick up specific APIs of structure streaming and we cover them in the uh, like uh, in the detailed manner. So I'll talk about what are those API in the end of the talk. So this is something I told people who are attending regularly will get benefited where you can kind of follow through different APIs uh, starting from today. So that's kind of a thing. And if you are interested to get the code, you can go here, you can clone the code and uh, you can uh, use it for yourself. Okay, let's start. Oh, I have not talked about myself. So my name is uh, Matukar Patak. I'm a consultant and trainer at datamantra.io. I think this is a bit old uh, slide. I also work for a company called Telus, where I manage uh, uh, analytics product. And if you are interested in uh, connecting with me, you can go to this website where I'm there in all the social medias out there. So that's kind of a very brief introduction. Okay, so uh, today, what is our agenda? So agenda is, uh, first thing we are going to talk about is, what is the evolution happened in the stream processing in last few years? So there's a humongous amount of things happening in the stream processing, which is just nothing to do with the Spark, but in stream processing in general. So what's going on? So I think we're going to start focusing on that. From there, we are going to talk about the APIs and examples. So, so that's kind of a very high level uh, uh, view. Okay. So uh, many of you told uh, you work in the stream processing. So let us say how many of you work with the Storm? Anyone from Storm? Okay, few of you. Anyone in the Spark streaming older API? Okay. Anyone in the Kafka streaming those things? Okay, few of you. And anyone from Flink? No. Uh, there is also a Samza, I think. The next version. Anyone Samza? Okay. So I can say most of you are working in the Storm or Spark streaming kind of a world. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is the world of stream processing has changed tremendously in last few years. What is the reason? One of the reasons behind the stream processing being so much uh, popular is if you look at the last few years, because of advent of the smartphones, nowadays everything is real time, right? If you look at uh, right from Twitter trends to uh, news or your uh, messaging systems, your everything, if you look at today, everything is streaming, right? For example, uh, uh, I was watching, let's say, cricket on your phone on Hotstar where you need to have a TV maybe a few years back, right? It's always on the go. So there is nothing like you do something overnight and you get a result. Those things are gone. Everything is done in the on the go. And when you do on the go, it's all about stream processing, right? How you kind of come up with the things, how you show the statistics. For example, uh, again, I'm taking an example of cricket. Uh, when you watch a cricket today in the app, you can see how many people are viewing the match. For example, I was watching the recent uh, India versus Australia match and if you look at till 40th over, it was around 700k uh, amount of views. But as the match goes to interesting point, maybe people are scoring runs or maybe the wickets are falling, the number of views keeps on increasing. You can see like 1.4 million people are watching. Those kind of statistics were never available to you in a TV based system earlier, right? So they may be come up with after a few days and say we had so many viewership. But today it's all real time. The reason is that they show is that kind of shows how much interest it is generating for that event. So I'm just taking an example of cricket, but if you take any other examples of any other events, today those statistics all are real time. So that is the one thing. The second thing is that user expectation from phones has changed these days, right? People don't want to wait. They want to do recharges from bookings to everything on the go and immediately. So second, lot of uh, stream processing. 
and also if you look at the recent trend in artificial intelligence for example google now your uh, voice assistant uh, your chat boards everything if you look at they are again real time which means whenever you want it the information has to be there uh, rather than waiting for few hours so those kind of are different factors in the business world kind of made stream processing much more important than what it used to be before so that's why i wanted to talk about evolution of stream processing uh, let us see what we mean so in the very beginning uh, in the time of storm or in the time of uh, uh, spark streaming the idea of of uh, stream was it's kind of a fast batch processing right so people who are using mapreduce they thought okay mapreduce take just lot of time i have to collect the data i have to start this job it runs it it gets a result maybe i'm looking at a delay of 30 to 1 30 minutes to 1 hour what about if i want to do something immediately maybe within a few minutes or maybe within a minute that's where the strong kind of system came along where they say it's kind of a faster things to do so that's what i'm saying is a fast batch processing system so stream processing is viewed as low latency batch processing which means the more more most focus is on how to get the things as fast as possible so that's the latency thing the second thing is that so that's where i was giving an example uh, storm took a stateless approach of message per message kind of a thing different uh, framework took up different approaches uh, spark took a mini batch approach where they are collecting data for few seconds then you run the batch processing and make sure that your runtime is so fast it feels like a stream so again it's not purely streaming but it's like feels like it now since it is focused on low latency what they did was they actually uh, made sure that like, they made sure that the api is not too powerful because if the api is too powerful which, which means you can do everything what you can do in the batch in the streaming then it becomes very difficult to build all these features but lot of people are saying no i am not going to do too much in streaming mostly what i'll do i stream the data i do some etl i enrich the data and dump it and most of the actual processing will be still done in the batch processing so they started with that idea we're saying that stream is low latency limited set of operations and most of the heavy lifting operations are done on the batch processing so that the framework can be done in a way that it gives you a low latency so that's why i say it's a less features compared to the batch system for example uh, when the storm initially came along they didn't have a uh, support for state which means i cannot remember things over a time and they did build a api or over that for example if you look at the uh, dstream api the ability to do few of the things i want to talk more about dstream later they were not there in the streaming api but they were there in the uh, batch api for example batch api had data frame for long but they were not able to add those kind of features into streaming easily because streaming was not built for that so which are the frameworks which looked at that like that for example strong and spark dstream api one of the famous examples for looking at stream processing as a faster batch processing now what are the issues with that uh the drawback is over a time when people started to build real advanced stream processing state became very very important right whenever the earlier systems were built they were thinking state is needed but it's a very limited state you remember for some time but we forgo but if you look at lot of application what i talked just now lot of things are stateful and they are not stateful for few hours they may be stateful for hours or months or things are actually running for a long long time so that is a one thing and what i want is that uh, is that people when they say okay how to solve the problem of less powerful api they came up with the lambda architecture so how many of you heard about lambda architecture okay so very famous word so i'll just explain you what is a lambda architecture lambda architecture says that you do few of the things in the stream and if you lose a state or if there is an issue you run a batch processing at the end of the day so that if you have missed something you will be recovered from that it's kind of more of a reconciliation so lambda architecture kind of says that stream processing has some of the limitations and those limitations are overcome using a batch processing so lambda architecture is kind of a Uh, ability to say that now what is the problem with the lambda architecture that comes of the duplication of effort which means now you have to implement the same logic in the two different systems even though spark helps you there because it's using the same api but it's not exactly same there are some things you need to do in the batch which are not there in the stream and vice versa which means there is a duplication of work and as the api is limited doing any kind of complex stream processing is always a challenge so i will talk about for example people who have done uh, let us say handling late events in uh, spark streaming 
you may know what is the challenge. There is no framework support, which means now you have to hack around some of the things to come up with that. But that is not a challenge in the Bash API, right? So in the Bash, there is no concept of late events because the, all the events are already there in your file. But in the streaming, they are real concern. So whenever you look at streaming as a fast processing system, you will miss these things because now you just not thought through some of those challenges which are only there in the streaming but not there in the batch. And finally, what happened is that anything which are specific to stream, there was no right abstraction in these systems because batch processing didn't have them. For example, one of the examples I gave was late events but also the concept of event time. So in the streaming, there is a different meaning of time. But in the batch, there is only one time. That is your uh, clock which is ticking in your computer. But in the streaming, there is a different abstraction of time. I am going to talk more about it. And also there is a concept of state recovery. In the batch, if something goes wrong, what you do? You rerun. Right? It's very simple. But in the streaming, that's not the case. You cannot just rerun because it will add a more latency. And also sometimes you may corrupt the state, which is more and more important for you. So some of the things which are easy to do in the batch, they become extremely difficult in streaming. So you cannot just look at the streaming as a fast batch processing, then you'll miss all these things. So that is kind of a drawback of the all those frameworks which looked at streaming as a fast batch processing. So that's kind of what we are starting. Now, then what is the solution? The solution, there are multiple solutions. Uh, the reason is that uh, people have come up with the different ideas to kind of uh, say, okay, this is the maybe the way to do it. One of the solution is taking stream as the default abstraction. So it's kind of reverses the equation. It says that stream processing is the default abstraction and batch is the limited stream. Whereas we used to say uh, stream is a fast batch processing. This is kind of a reverse of that. So what they say, uh, stream becomes the default abstraction both in terms of runtime and both in terms of the API. And then what is the batch processing? Batch processing is looked at, a, looked at as a bounded stream processing. Because you can think even like that, right? For example, uh, what uh, stream, like a Spark streaming says that your stream is a very small chunk of files in a very high level. What, uh, let us say, this framework says that your file is a bounded stream, which means there is a start and end, <coughs> and in a stream processing, there is an unbounded stream. It's a different way of looking at the things. So what is the adva uh, like a advantage of this is, now since the stream processing itself is the basic uh, abstraction layer, then you can do any kind of complex things in this framework. Why? Because there is a, by default, everything is stream. Whatever the stream processing you want to do, it is out of the box. And also, since they have done the stream as a default abstraction, they have a strong state APIs, which means all kind of uh, state transformations, state recovery, etc., etc. So the uh, frameworks which have taken this approach are Flink and Beam. I think we have talked about Flink at uh, some point of time, and also there was a talk from uh, Google uh, uh, person about Beam also, but very basic idea is that they kind of rethinking that rather than going with the uh, batch as a kind of a core architecture and building a stream on top of it, what if we kind of reverse that altogether, right? Now, there are challenges with that. Now, what are the challenges I'm talking here today? There may not be true in a year or two because this is an area which is just getting started. Because if you look at the overall, this architecture of Flink or Beam, <laughs> this came like a two, two, year, two and a half year back. So whatever the things I'm taking, uh, talking here, you have to take it in like a little of uh, skepticism because this may change over the fact. But what I'm going to say is that today, what are the challenges of using this as a architecture for uh, your frameworks? What are the things? One is that stream as an abstraction makes it difficult to combine stream data with the batch data. One of the nice property of a Spark streaming is you can easily combine batch data with the stream data, right? Because both are batch, you can do a join. But if you go reverse way, streams are not well meant for joins because there is always this uh, saying that how you know that is the both the windows what you are joining are correct. So that's why if you look at the uh, Flink API, which has this, they didn't have a batch join for a long, long time. So which means enriching your stream with the batch is not so straightforward. What they say is that convert your file as a stream, kind of a little bit of hack. So that is a one. <coughs> Second one is that uh, stream works great for a lot of this uh, map, flat map based APS. For example, a lot of uh, APS what we see in RDD or those kind of things, they don't work really well for SQL. Because if you look at a lot of data what we work today, both in the streaming or in the batch, 
there are a lot of data we work is structured data correct even in your stream what you are getting you are getting a json you are getting xml or maybe you are getting a, like some kind of a, your own format very rarely we get just the strings there are use cases but it's maybe out of 100 it's like a 2 3% so if you look at the stream as an abstraction there is no concept of schema by default in this framework at least so then what happens is that now you have to build a kind of a schema on top of it so which means uh, writing this sql kind of a thing here maybe sql i mean the sql queries or sql kind of a data frame kind of a, what do you say uh, dsl becomes a little bit tricky right now also uh, there are efforts so what i have told here is that as i told you it's not complete there are efforts people are saying can we build this feature for example there is an effort to say how to naturally combine batch data with a stream when there's a stream is a default abstraction and also there is an effort of flink sql what they are trying to do is that they are trying to build a sql interface on top of a stream abstractions but in today's world if you are using these frameworks these are the challenges you will run into even though you get a better streaming system than your uh, older fast processing system you will run into these issues so the reason i have talked about these issues is uh, when i talk about structure streaming they have tried to solve some of this in a different manner does it make sense so this is a one of the approach to say how we solve the problem of stream processing one answer is reverse the equation where we say everything is stream is by default and build your batch and stream api on top of it and if you are interested to know more about flink uh, just go and search in our uh, youtube channel you will get two three talks on uh, flink streaming and how they work okay yeah one more thing i forgot to tell i don't have a slide call at all like any questions so if you have any questions in between just uh, stop me and you can ask a question okay that's continue now before i uh, talk about what is the solution to the problem i just talked about let me just uh, take a regression and talk about what are the drawbacks of the api itself because i earlier i just talked about what is the drawbacks of the approach of a dstream api let me talk about a little bit of the drawbacks of the api itself uh, i i am thinking that most of the people even though they have not worked in the spark streaming they have seen the apis right most of you may be have seen the structure streaming the first thing is that uh, you know spark streaming is a mini batch execution right so it's like a faster batch processing system one of the issue with that is the api is actually tied into the runtime which means even though in the future if uh, they want to change it to a really streaming system they cannot because there are so many things in the api which makes it difficult to make it a really streaming system one of the things is that uh, if you see uh, in your uh, example every this stream api example start with the batch time correct what you create when you create a, your streaming context you give actually how much time is that batch time that kind of tells you that it is a micro batch right there is no way to say i don't care about the time you do as fast as possible or any way you like there is no way because in the api it's embedded that the batch time has to be specified that kind of gives an indication that the run time and the apis are highly coupled so that is the one thing and also the batch time dictates lot of this window and state in the uh, you are a streaming system for example how you handle the uh, late events maybe you increase your batch time or you kind of play with your window time to figure out can okay, make sure that things are always there or also how you make sure that the state is not going to be kept forever all those things are done respect to your batch time which means batch time dictates lot of the designs what you do but most of the time if you think about streaming i should not be thinking about batch time right batch time is just the implementation detail which spark has to figure out by itself or i'll give somewhere else but here it is the part of the api so this is one of the biggest challenge in the this stream where they have coupled the mini batch execution of the underneath run time with the whatever the api they have exposed in the this stream api okay that is a one uh, drawback next yeah so the second drawback is uh, not really a drawback till uh, a year back is the it is a based on rdd api so if you look at the uh, this stream internally it is using a rdd api what is the issue most of the world has moved on uh, most of the world is enjoying the data set and data frame apis which has a better execution on those kind of things but people who are coding streaming they are actually left with this uh, rdd world right so that is the one thing and as a dish team uses a rdd all the tungsten or all this performance benefits which happened in 1.4 1.5 2.0 which is actually over 2 years they are not actually came to the uh, 
streaming world. Now people may say, no, no, I was converting my RDD to, to a data frame and doing it, but it was like a hack. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes it does not. A lot of benefits you get in the runtime, they are actually not translated. So that is one of the things. And also a lot of people wanted to run SQL queries. For example, there are nice UDFs, there are nice things to uh, do it in a data frame world. You can't use it in the streaming because they are not compatible. So that is one of the things. And because of this runtime API tied up to the API itself, the reason they were not able to introduce data frame into the streaming, that was one of the reasons. They cannot just rip off the RDD and just say use a data frame like they did it in the batch. It is much more complicated than that. That's why it got, kind of got uh, delayed till 2.0. In the 2.0, they thought, okay, it, we now rethink the whole thing. Okay, so this is a second drawback. What is the third one? Yeah, one of the trigger point uh, for the rethinking of the stream processing is the concept of time, right? So when I was thinking about time, so I was watching a recently a TV show which actually talks about time. So people uh, may have seen uh, like a movies about time traveling, right? People going from one uh, time to another time. This is, we are not talking, talking about a time travel here, but this is kind of that. For example, what is a time? Normally time is uh, what we see in the watch and what we see in the, let us say in the TV. So you know, when you travel across the world, time changes for you. And if you go to US, uh, you will lose a day. If you come back from US, you will gain a day. People know about these things, right? But again, you will lose that day what you have saved in the travel, but that's a different case, but that's the case. Now, what happens if the time in the streaming is, there are multiple times. What, does, what that means? Let us say there is an event coming from sensor, right? Now, the sensor has something called birthday. So, recently I was talking to someone, they were saying event time should be called as a birthday. What is a birthday? It means it is the time when the event got generated. Normally, we call it as an event time. Then there is also con concept of processing time. What is a processing time? It is the time where event actually came for processing. And also there is a concept of ingestion time where it actually got injected into maybe a Kafka or any of those systems. And if you look at these times, normally we like to believe they are all same. But in the real world, they are not same. Maybe there is a, a sensor uh, which was not able to connect to network, which got delayed maybe for an hour. What the time you get in the processing time may be completely different than what is the time uh, you get it in the event time. It's very similar to, let us say, uh, I will give an example. Let us say someone sent a mail to you uh, and it got delivered half an hour later. But the timestamp what they show you that when this time, like a uh, mail is sent, is actually the time when they have sent it. So it's not actually the time which you got received or which came into Gmail or something like that. Because that time tells me that when exactly that person is trying to contact me. I will tell you an example. Let us say it is your birthday and someone sent you happy birthday in the WhatsApp. Because some reason you are not connected uh, for internet and after an hour you got the message. But the timestamp but it still shows you are 12.01, right? That kind of tells you, okay, this person is really good. She or she was trying to tell me the happy birthday on real time. Now think about uh, the time mismatch. Let us say if it is showing one o'clock, you may not be so interested saying, okay, uh, he, that person is not so good. So in the stream processing also, the meaning of the result are heavily depend upon the time. And in the DStream API, there is no concept of uh, ingestion time or event time. It's always processing time. The reason is simple. Since it is a batch driven system and you are putting that batch time, which is driven by the processing time because Spark cannot know the, what is the time happening in the outside of its system. So since uh, windowing is uh, not possible on the other things, what people used to do is that they used to build things around it to kind of uh, support this uh, concept of uh, event time and uh, ingestion time. But if it is not there in the framework level, it becomes very, very difficult to handle. So these are the few limitations. Again, I can go on about a uh, lot of the difficulties you will see in the streaming API. But these are the three main important factors which kind of uh, shows you that uh, looking at the stream processing as a fast batch processing has its own limitation. And if they come across the API, which is kind <coughs> of reflecting that, using that API for these new systems, like new generation streaming systems, it's a very, very challenging system. Does it um, make sense? Okay, so what is the answer to that? Right, so that's where we start with structured stream. Yeah. The last point, the windowing other than time is not possible. Oh yeah, uh, this is, okay. So, Normally, okay, you know what is a window, right? It is something happened over a time. That's what we say. But sometimes 
what happened over the time is not only the thing what we want to look at. So I will give an example. Let us say I am tracking a user over a session, <coughs> right? What is the beginning of session when the user logs into the system? What is the end of the session? There are two scenarios when the session expires or session logs out. Does it make sense? Or the, sorry, you, when the user logs out. But if you see the user log in and log out, is it tied to the time? Not really. Any user can come in any point of time and they can go forever. Now let us say, what if I want to create a window over these kind of features? This is called as in uh, streaming sessionization, which means creating sessions which are not tied to the time. In the DStream API, there is no way to define these kind of windows. So we'll not talk about that today, but in the next few sessions we'll talk about, you can define these windows which are nothing to do with the time at all, which are driven by maybe here I'm giving a user login and logout, Maybe sometimes there is a trigger. So what kind of a trigger it is? For example, uh, let us say uh, I am defining a window on a thermostat which is uh, triggered by a threshold. Again, which is nothing to do with the time. Maybe it go for a month even. The window may be going for a month or maybe it's a two minutes because something has changed. So there are some scenarios in the stream processing where window is not the time. It's maybe something else. Does it answer your question? No. Yeah. Yeah. Provide advantage compared to the Spark DStream API. Lot of things. So whatever I told, you cannot do in the DStream API. Flink can do it. So whatever the limitations I talked about, most of the things Flink can do it. Okay. All right. So let us talk about then introduction. What now? There is a problem. Then there has to be a solution. If there is no solution, I will not be giving a talk, right? So what I'll be doing actually coding or maybe I'll asking others what is the solution to it. Okay, that's where we come into the introduction to structured streaming. So if you look at the name, there is a streaming, but also there is a name structured streaming. Earlier the streaming is to call as a spark streaming, right? They have removed the spark word because you know, if you are in the spark, you are talking about spark streaming, but they have introduced the concept of structured stream. What is that? Now, I told that in the earlier case, we were looking at stream as a mini batch or sometimes we were looking at the stream as a kind of a unbounded uh, file kind of a thing. What is the abstraction layer what Spark is talking about? Here is, a, in structure streaming, a stream is modeled as an infinite table. Okay, that's why the name comes as a structure streaming. So the word structure means that a stream is looked at as an infinite table. So what is the table contains? It contains the rows and columns. Does it make sense? All right, that is the first thing. Second thing is that since we are talking about table abstraction, that's why the name of structured streaming comes out, which means from the framework layer itself, a stream is a structured stream. It is not just a you are by stream or it's not on structured data. This is the biggest revolution Spark has done in the big data world. In the big data, it used to be always unstructured data, right? If you look at the Hadoop, MapReduce, all those things. But with the Spark 2.0, what they have told is structured is more important than unstructured world. That's why they have changed all the user-facing APIs from RDD to data set. And now they are doing the same thing for the streaming world. So in the streaming, they are saying maybe everyone else looks at the things as a by stream or just a stream. We are going to look at the stream as the infinite table where there's a structure associated with it, which means every stream what you get has a structure with it. So that is the one thing. Now, all the input sources, stream transformation, everything internally modeled as data set. So what is the abstraction what Spark uses for structured data? It is a data set, which is kind of a super data frame. So in streaming also, now they are using the same abstraction what they used in the batch API. So that is kind of a, a theme in the Spark. Uh, Spark is all about unification, which means they want to use the same API across the board. Now, what they have done is they are kind of taking the things they have learned in the data frame and data set world. Now they are moving into the streaming world. Now, what is the advantage? Advantage is that if you look at your stream as an infinite table, how you do transformation using SQL? Because if you have a table underneath, now you can start writing your all your uh, operations on the stream as a SQL or a data set, yes. Yeah. Because there is no limit to it. The data can keep on coming to your uh, system. 
so the table keeps on growing. So means columns will be added. Columns. Uh, not columns. I can say it's more of a rows. Rows can keep on becoming bigger. So I can say, let us say your database table is a finite table because you know when you query the data, you know how many uh, rows are there. But in the stream, you never know because the stream keeps on getting bigger and bigger. So this is the way I was saying uh, in the fling, uh, file is of bounded stream. Here bounded means I know the beginning and end. Infinite is kind of a reverse of that, where I know, don't know the end of the uh, stream. Does it make sense? But applying a SQL abstraction, you still require some boundedness, some window over which you can... Oh, we'll talk about it. Yeah. Okay. So now the question is, how exactly this whole thing works, that we were going to have examples and I will not talk much about runtime, uh, but are, there are some tricks they have used in order to do these things. Does it make sense? What is the abstraction layer, what they are uh, talking about? Okay. Okay, what is the advantage? One of the biggest advantage is that it is a... Structured data analysis is at the heart of the system, which means no more I have to do read the data and convert it to JSON myself. I don't have to do a lot of these schema things myself. It is part of the framework and it is given for you. Second one is that since uh, it is using the same abstraction, I can I can easily combine with the batch data because your batch data is still talking about data set or data frame. I can combine data frame of a stream with the data frame of a batch, which is very, very important. One other thing is that it can use the full power of SQL. We are going to see some of the examples in the future to do the state. For example, uh, in your uh, DStream API, we had this concept of update state by key. What is that means? I'm going to update the state by myself. Even in the fling, the state is not built in always, which means I have to be explicit about the state. But since we are doing SQL, it can figure out which are the SQL constructs need state and which are the ones don't need a state. So some of those optimizations they are doing. And of course, since they are using SQL, all the catalyst what we have maybe talked about in the batch API, all the optimization, they come over to the streaming system also. So finally, it is easy to learn and maintain. People may not believe me. So when we see the example, you will see doing a stream processing using the data set API is much more easier to understand compared to your typical stream processing system what you can see in the outside. Yeah. So how is the performance and scalability of this system? Yeah, so the performance is uh, good enough. So again, it is kind of on par of the stream API. Uh, scalability in terms of the, there is a limitation on features currently because uh, all the features which are they had in the stream API, they are all not actually came into the uh, new streaming API because of the this uh, concept of data set. They have to now translate all those things they used to do earlier into a better abstraction. But I know people are using, some of the companies are using uh, in the uh, production, but it also got on, out of beta, I think five weeks back or six weeks back, not too long ago. So the Spark structure streaming became a, a stable version in Spark 2.2, even though it started in 2.0. So it's not a stable API from long time, but there are people I know who are using even from 2.1, so. All right. So from now on, what I'm going to do is, uh, I'm going to talk about the API. So till I, I think till now what I've talked about is the ideas and kind of what is the motivation behind the structure streaming. So structure streaming is kind of a rethinking what is the streaming is in the new generation of uh, systems, right? So it kind of goes away from the concept of uh, using a batch only like for a mini batch system. And also it will go away from the idea of using an RDD. So all the issues you had in the DStream API, this API is trying to solve. Does it make sense? So from now on, what I'm going to do is that I will go into show some of the API example, which will show you how different it is compared to your uh, DStream API and how same it is compared to your uh, data frame or data set API. Does it make sense? Okay, so the first API what I'm going to show, uh, normally we start with the word count, but today I'm not even going to start with the word count. So there is a, even before that, Normally when you talk about stream, there is a concept of source and sync, right? Source is where you read the data from and sync is where you write the data to. Now in the DStream, the sources were well defined, but syncs were not. In the DStream, there was not really concept of a sync because in a batch API, sync do not make much sense. But uh, in uh, structure streaming, there is a source and sync. So uh, what we are doing is that we are using a socket stream for an example here. So we are going to read the data from uh, socket stream <coughs> and we are going to write the data to console sync. 
what is the console saying? It just prints the output. Uh, that is the thing. And if you look at this example, everything is a data frame and a data set. So let us say when you read the data from a socket, what the data you get? You get a string because here we are uh, working with a uh, text uh, socket stream and that is represented using a data frame which has a single field. It used to be represented as a dstream of a string or rdd of string earlier. Now it is represented as a data frame where there is a value which is a single field. And what we do is in the other examples we will see how to use the data set and data frame API to work with that. But here how to read the data and how to display the data. That's only I am going to focus. So, for socket stream, for socket stream. So depending upon the stream source, it will change the data frame. Okay. So can we not give the schema to the socket stream? Uh, it is not determined by the program, it is determined by the source of the uh, code of the source. It is similar to, uh, you know, in the batch API, there is a schema inference. Right? If you read the CSV, there is a schema inference. If there is a JSON, there is a schema inference. Similar thing, it is not a schema inference, but there is a schema, we can give a schema. We will show you what that means. Here, yeah, the data frame is an alias of a data set. Yes, so it's a Spark 2.0. So data frame is just an alias to a data set. One of the reasons why structure streaming uses a data frame rather than a data set mm -hmm. is, in a batch API, we need a lot of compilation checks. But in the streaming, it's a little bit different. So by default, it, they go with a data frame, but you can convert into a data set. We have some examples where we go from a data frame to a data set. And people who have not seen 2.0 code, uh, you may be a little bit surprised to see some of the new changes, but it may be a chance to learn the 2.0 also. Uh, Shashank, can we move to code? Okay, first thing, uh, okay, this is the word count. Where is my uh, socket? Uh, do we have a socket? Yeah, socket data. Yeah. Uh, everyone is able to see the code, right? First thing is that uh, there is. Uh, we are going to use a, a Spark session. Uh, we don't need to create a special context for uh, doing the, uh, what do you say, uh, streaming. So you used to have a streaming context and those kind of things, they are gone. Uh, here again, I can give a local, I'll talk about some of the questions you may have in the mind when we are uh, looking at the code, but I'll have a dedicated slide for that. So we'll say what are the things. This is what I'm going to focus on. So in the Spark session, we used to have dot read for our batch API. Right? We say session dot read or we say SQL context dot read. Now it is called as a read stream. This kind of a signifies that I'm reading a stream. But if you look at the API, it looks very similar to your batch API. We say format. Here I'm talking about a socket. Normally you say CSV or uh, JSON. And option I'm giving, uh, I'm reading from localhost. I'm uh, giving a port 50050 and load. And finally, how I write it to console, I say socket stream dot write stream. I'll give a console uh, format. I'll talk more about output mode later, but it, this is reading from the stream. This is writing into the streams. Then how I start this program? I create something called query, take the writer and start, and query await termination. This is very similar to your uh, streaming context of await termination, which uh, uh, waits till you terminate your program. Does code make sense? Okay, before we run, uh, let us go to the command line. Let me start that. Uh, Thing. Okay, maybe I have to zoom in a little. How you zoom in? Oh, it doesn't work. Okay, that's fine. So I will tell you the command. You say nc hyphen minus lk uh, five double zero five zero. So what we have done is that this is a command just to create a socket. Now let us go and start our uh, run our program. <laughs> Uh, the socket stream is built in so uh, source. It's part of the uh, Spark itself. Just to make it a little bit bigger. Right. So it started. I'm not going to talk about the execution at all as of now. So let us see. There is work. Uh, let us go and say, uh, "Welcome to Meetup." And enter. Let's go there. Uh, does it print? Should print somewhere in the top. Ah, it's coming. And as I told you that, do you see this column name? And if you see the structure, it looks like a data frame dot show. Right. So that's why I was saying it is a part of the uh, data frame, and that's it's printing the value. 
Till now, everyone is fine? Just one question. Yeah. To uh, start the streaming, do we need to define the sync? It's not compulsory that? Yes. Because if you don't have a sync, everything is lazy. You need to have a sync. So here there is no concept of printer value. Oh, we will ta talk about that. Any other questions? Do we have a Python API for this? You have. Yeah. You have. Any other questions? Okay. Now, when I was doing the slides, yeah, let's go to slides. Okay. Yeah, let's go to the next slide. I have a dedicated slide. Questions from people who have seen the DStream API. Because when I was writing a code, I said, oh, what if about this? What about that? Then I said, you have to have a slide for that. The first question I asked, where is the bash tag? Right, we are not, we are, don't create a streaming context. We don't have a bash tag. In the structure streaming, there is no bash tag. Okay, as simple as that, you don't need to care about it. Then people say, oh, is it really streaming? Not really, there is a twist to the story, but I'll uh, talk to that later. So this is the first thing, uh, where is the bash time? How frequently it is going to run? The answer to that, there is no bash time. How frequently is as soon as possible? So what is as soon as possible means? In a very high level, you can think as and when the message comes in, it will run. That's the one way of uh, thinking about it. But there is a small difference in Because when I say, if it's a message, then people start comparing with the storm or flink. Because storm is always this message comes in and you do, right? This is not exactly same. I am going to talk more about it in a few slides, but you can think there is no bash time. You don't need to specify. And by default, it's as soon as possible, which means as and when the message comes, it tries to Process it. Okay. Just go to the code. Yeah, just let us go to the code. Code. Yeah, just. There, what we are saying, date termination on. Yeah. Is it going on loops or updates? Yeah, it just uh, waits till, waits the program till you kill it. It just keeps on, uh, uh, it's kind of a infinite while loop. Infinite while loop, any, any break period? No, it's infinite. So because in the streaming, we want to run it forever, right? Yeah. No, no, you, it is uh, waiting for interrupt. 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 You have to interrupt manually or you can send an interrupt, but there is no time associated. So if we want to perform some transformation, we can do on this data frame. Yeah, we'll talk about it. So we'll talk more about the API. This is just an example. Let us go back. As soon as possible means uh, event-based or time-based? Like uh, we'll talk about it. Yeah. So as soon as possible, the uh, underneath API is processing time equal to zero. So it's a time-based thing. So it's a time-based thing. Okay. Second one. If you look at the API very carefully, the away termination now is not on the Spark session, but it's on the query. If you look at the earlier examples, where we put a, a termination on your streaming context. So what that tells you is that can we have multiple queries, which means multiple different kind of a stream processing on the same program? You can. This is one of the, I think, uh, drawbacks, which I have not talked about in earlier streaming API. You can have only one graph of processing and they used to have same time associated with it. But in the st structure streaming, you can have multiple queries and some queries cannot may be saying no our termination. They may come in, they do something and they go away. There are some queries we are which are uh, listening forever. Does it make sense? So our termination is not on the session. It is on the query which kind of tells you that there can be multiple queries. Again, the query what I'm saying is that you can think it is a processing you are doing in the stream. So the stream processing what you used to do in the Earlier API, it is called as a query in the structure stream. That makes sense, right? Because we are talking about a table, the processing is done as a query. So if we have multiple queries, uh, when will the main program will turn off when all the queries are terminated? There is, uh, actually the main program never ever uh, stays alone. It goes away. Only the reason why the main program is staying alive here is because of local. Since we are saying local and we are uh, awaiting on the same query which is created in the uh, local, it is uh, remembering, but after that, in if you look at the driver and all, once uh, all the threads which are running and that, which is our queries, once they go away, that also go away. something like. That. No, my question is that okay, I am awaiting a termination. Okay? Yeah. And then just after that, I want to create one more query. Yeah. So will that Spark session be available after that? Or? Yeah. So in that sense, it is like a multi-threaded program. 
So you don't wait on the main thread. You wait. You create a new thread and like a run the every termination on that. Before even the first one terminates. Yeah, something like that. So I will go a little bit more about it later. But what was the question is how I ever terminate on multiple queries? It is your typical multi-threaded programming where you create multiple threads and wait on them rather than waiting on a main thread because if you block the main thread, anything else after the await termination will not. Run. Okay. In this case, for the other uh, command prompt where we say that NC is something, right? Yeah. If we terminate, this will be a... Uh, no. That is a source. Whatever NCA minus LK we are doing, it's a source of the data. Okay. If the source goes away, we'll get an error saying that the source is not there, but this program will not stop. So, actually, what's happening is internally Spark is using an executor service. The, the, the concurrent uh, programming language is using an executor service. Okay, the second one is that we didn't specify local of two. How does it work? Right? This is one of the things people may say when you start with the stream processing in uh, Spark, keep local of two, otherwise nothing will happen. I think Spark people have understood that people will anyway forget. They have solved the problem. So now the processing thread is different than the source thread from where it reads. So even if you say local, it does not care. It always creates a thread which is separate for reading from a socket. And whatever the local or local of two, what you are specifying, that is only for a processing thing, not for the uh, reading from the socket. So that how solved that problem. Oh, okay. As this program is using a data frame, what about the schema inference? Right. One of the features of the data frame API in the like uh, your uh, uh, batch API, it can do schema inference, which means by looking at the data, it can figure out the schema rather than you te telling about it. In the structure streaming, there is no schema inference. Some of the sources, the schema is given to you, but they static. Just if, let us say, if you are sending a socket with a JSON, it will not automatically convert to a JSON for you. But there are some places where it can do the schema uh, validation, but it is not a schema <coughs> inference, which means, oh, maybe the source is giving the schema for you. Otherwise, you need to specify the schema using the data frame schema APIs. There, but there is no schema inference, which makes sense because schema inference on a stream is not easy. Right? In a file, we can read a header or we can say, this is the beginning, I will do some schema inference. But in the stream, it is not possible. So what they have done is, there is no schema inference, but still the, there is a schema. There is a difference, right? Schema inference is a kind of dynamically figure out the schema. Schema itself is saying that what is the structure you get. This is the reason why we are saying that you know, schema inference is not uh, working. Uh, because in the stream, there is not really a beginning or an end. So normally how with the schema inference happens in the batch API, for example, for CSV, it looks at the header for the name of the columns and it goes through the data in order to figure out what is the type of the things. What we are saying is there is no end to the getting the data. Correct. But schema inference. Schema yeah. Inference no, but schema right. inference, this is not just the name of the column, it's also the type of the columns. But that will be always uh, in the sense. Not it really. It can, it can change. In the stream, it can change. So okay, I will tell you the very uh, very briefly, in the batch what it does, it goes across the, all the data to figure out what is the common denominator. Let us say I have a column which has a string and numbers. It says it's a string. But in the stream, maybe initially I got the numbers, now it got changed to strings. There is no guarantee here because I cannot see the end. I cannot determine what is the type of the column. So we missed that. Yeah. yeah, I will take it as offline. So I will talk about it. Yeah. Some what will happen to the underneath optimizations which are happening because we know the schema beforehand? The user is responsible for doing that. See, you have an API, I'll show you in the future, that you can give a schema, then you get all the benefits. It's only that user has to do that work. It's like, it won't dynamically change? It will not do dynamic, it will not dynamically change. So Spark is not going to do... No, because it kind of breaks your API, your code, right? <laughs> if it is dynamically changing between the types, your code will not uh, run correctly. So it's up to you to make sure that the schema is correct. Any other questions? Yeah. 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 It's the same idea. Okay. 
I think so. So many questions here itself. Let us move on. Now, uh, people who are done the storm or a fling will have question is, is as soon as possible is same as event possible. I, this is something we have it in mind. Sparkle as soon as possible, that's what I talked about, which is not really same as event possible. Why? If you look at the fling, the way it runs is, if you let us say you have four operations, there is our source, map, flat map, and there is you are doing aggregation and writing closing. There is like operations. What fling does for each of this operation, it is running a kind of a process and it's piping the data through those processes. Okay, so that's the kind of implementation detail. What that means is that, let us say you have five operations. I'm just giving a very high level point of view. Think that you have five boxes, which is always running this map, flat map. It gets the data, it does the operation, it just passes over to the another process. Something like that, which means whatever the process it is running, it's always taking your resources. Does it make sense? What I mean by like uh, event processing? But in Spark, it is different. As and when it gets the data, it spawns these processes, it does the processing, and it will kill off. Do you understand what is the difference? Flink is always running programs, which is streaming the data across the uh, these programs. But in the Spark, it spawns the task as and when the data comes in, it does the processing, and goes up. So when you're saying processes, they're actual physical uh, processes? Or yeah, it can be. I'm just using an analogy. Okay. Here, processes can be a threads or anything. But I'm saying they are spawned, they are used, and they are gone away. Which means, if there is no data coming in, Spark streaming will be not taking any of your cluster uh, uh, resources because there is nothing happening. But even the Fling system, there is always have, like taking those things. What is the difference? There is a delay to create this task and execute. Right? I'll uh, agree, right? It's not as fast as having it. something is always running and passing across it. There is a delay of uh, doing that. That's why Spark structure streaming is still mini batch, not your typical event processing system what you see in the Flink or a Storm. So, what is the advantage of doing it? If they get to use all the batch API underneath runtime. The worker processor will be there, but worker processor will be not using any CP. So what the worker normally does, it creates a new thread for processing. That thread creation happens when the data comes in. But in the fling, you can think that thread is always there. Then at the resource level, my process is still holding the resources, although it's not using it. In terms of memory, it is, but in terms of CPU, it is not. It is uh, running on a yarn or anything kind of system. Yeah. Have the content itself. Yeah. Kind of, right? So the content will be taken out of your uh, feed capacity. Yes, yes. All those so kind of. Yeah. So it is ideal. It can't be used by. Correct, correct. So again, there's some. there are some implementation details how you can maximize it. But in a very high level, what I'm saying is that the thread which needs to be, or the process which needs to be executing that, it is not always alive. It goes away once the data is done. Uh, I will not talk about it, I will take about it later. So that, that, that is nothing to do with the API, it's more of a, a dynamic scaling and those kind of stuff. Now the question you may ask why, the so answer is simple, it allows them to reuse the runtime. See the runtime of Spark is never ever been stream processing. Right? It's always a batch and you cannot uh, change the thing overnight. It takes time. So what they have done is that they have changed the API, which is nothing to do with the batch time anymore, but they have kept the runtime. So that's why you cannot say, it is as similar to your event processing. But one of the things they are done is, it is as fast as possible, which means that you get some lesser latency what you used to get in the dish. Make sense? I will show you in the graphically uh, what that means. If you look at the uh, Flink, uh, I'm just taking a Flink, it can be true in the storm also, is that Flink has this operator graph where there is a source, there is a flat map, there is a map, there is aggregation. This is for a word count example and think that each of them running as a process. And the data is streamed across it, and the delay is very, very small, because it just takes the data, it runs through the thing. This is real event processing, which means the things are running, and you are streaming the data across the system. What about Spark? I'm taking a table here. Let us say I have a socket with have A and B. The first, first row goes in, that's as soon as possible. Then it is a batch one. It 
uh, run some app stage, <coughs> stage, then it takes a sync stage. Here they spawn the task. Done. Then it takes the second row, spawn task, do done. Does it make sense? So if uh, the second row comes and the first row is being processed, okay. it, will it wait? Or yeah, now the question is what about the synchronization? Which means when the first row is getting processed, let us say it's a long thing, when the second row comes, what happens? If you look at the fling kind of system, the blocking is only done at the uh, aggregation layers, which means map flat map never cares because it can do things in parallel, you can do multi events. There is a blockage because in the aggregation, because you need to get the right state. Right, there may be some uh, things you, for example, you are sorting, then there has to be a right thing. But in the structure streaming, it always waits till the first batch is completed. Right, it is the same your D stream runtime, which means the what D stream does till your first batch is completed, it never ever start the second batch. Same with the D stream, sorry, the structure stream till the first row is completed, your second row. That's why it's called as as soon as possible. When is possible? When the first row is complete. Then how will it use? No, this is not an advantage. It's re reusing the same runtime, which is actually in the your <coughs> typical batch. What happens? This batch one is your file, and the your this code is same, right? Now what they have done is that they want to use the underneath the runtime. They cannot just uh, have a streaming runtime. So that's why they are just saying this is a batch one. Run the task done. Second batch on the task and done. But then how will it uh, exploit the concurrency? Uh, so here concurrency means if there are, see here I am taking just an example of one event at a, one batch. Yeah. But there can be a lot of events. So yeah. you may get like 100 events at them. Again 100 events can be processed parallelly. Same uh, so one, idea. One thing. batch will be processed parallelly. Yeah one batch is similar to your concept of uh, what do you say, uh, creating multiple chunks. All those will so apply. Basically, one batch will be partitioned, yeah, partitioned and, then, and ran all and those things. Be so between the batches, there is a, a synchronization step where you say, uh, "We are going to wait." If I don't specify any mechanism of uh, doing the rounding of batch, then uh, how will it? It is always the time. So in the example, what I have taken is that once the one message is came, it's actually started the boundary. Till that message is done, it is still the same batch. It is creating for you. Yeah. So how does it identify that how many events I have to participate in the batch? It is driven by the time. So let us say I have uh, my let us say <coughs> my uh, resolution is a millisecond, right? For every millisecond, whatever the events I got into the system, those are created as a batch. Yeah, so by default it's a zero, that zero kind of signifies that milliseconds where you say every millisecond whatever the things you got, that's your batch. So <coughs> let's say that this was processing, uh, while the first batch was processing, you yeah. got maybe initially you got 100 rows, yeah. you were processing those 100 rows, then you got 1000 rows. You still go with 1000. So, so there will be only one batch only? Yes, yes. So it's a purely time period. So there is, there is no way to say it is a count or anything else. Whatever you got in that time, that's no, no, question. so that's uh, that's what my question is yeah. that when you got those thousand rows, yeah. maybe you got those over a period of let's say five milliseconds. So yeah. will there be like five, two hundred tuple batches or will there be only one thousand tuple batch? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, I will answer that question when I talk about trigger API. So, so as of now, it's very difficult to explain as soon as possible model. When you have a trigger API, we'll talk about it. Okay. How do we preserve the state in this case? Sorry? How do we preserve the state? Uh, we have not done any transformation. When we do a transformation, I will show you the states. So even in this case, how is yeah. the backward handling built into the system? Yeah, it is a same, uh, what do you say, streaming had a, uh, what do you say, reactive system back pressure, it is part of that. But again, the source and the system has to support, for example, if you go with a Kafka, mm -hmm. you will get the So, this is the same. How different is this from these things so okay so now the difference in the d stream versus this one is and there is a one twist which i have not revealed it so as a storyteller you should not tell everything but it is a better api same runtime which may see if you think about it why are you see a lot of questions what you are asking is i don't want to think about batch time right if the system is able to do as soon as possible maybe that's what i want that's what you are given the api but the runtime of course it's the same thing 
They cannot fix the runtime immediately. So what they have done is they have removed a lot of this craft they had in the API and told, okay, you can use it, but in the runtime, they are doing very similar stuff. That's the kind of a huge change. So no, maybe it's a real-time real processing. It's a not real-time, near real. It's a real-time. But it's better than Spark. Uh, older APIs. Yes, yes. But, but the industry always tend to prefer Spark streaming rather than Flink. Why? Uh, there is a lot of things. There is a developer availability, there is a money, there is a support, which is nothing to do with technology. So it's like uh, why people prefer, let us say, Java versus Scala. I say Scala is much better than Java, but most of people stick with Java because to find a Scala guy, is very difficult, or Scala girl, so whatever. So there is a other factor which are nothing to do with the technology. And Flink is new. Flink is like two, three year old uh, in terms of the uh, like availability and maturity. Yeah, it's the, it actually started in the same time, but it got really popular in 2015 or sometime. Spark streaming really got popular by 2013. So if you are first, then you have that benefit. Uh, but it's more of nothing to do with technology. It's more of availability uh, and the people's uh, uh, battle tested. People have used in a lot of places. They know what are the quicks. And Flink is not yet fully battle tested I mean, across the board, which means people may, may not know what are the issues may be there, etc. So for Flink, you were mentioning that it does not wait different batches. Yes, right? there is no concept of batch there. But then, uh, won't you auto, uh, indefinitely start having these threads which will keep on processing all the batches? You no, don't create a new threads. It's always the same thread which is kind of uh, taking things and going. So then, so when you actually see, if you go to the UI, just go to the left, uh, no, no, so go to the slides, uh, before slide. Ah, do you see this parallelism here? This parallelism says how many things can run in the same operator. So operator is map, how many things I can process at a time. That parallelism is controlled by the user, which means by default it's one message at a time. Which if another message comes, it buffers and it fades. But if I increase this parallelism, it can handle multiple uh, events at a time. So this is controlled by the user in the flink. I can change those numbers. Again, we are going too much into the Flink and this. There is a Flink talk earlier, but we will have a dedicated session Flink versus Structure Streaming. But let, let us move on. So if you have any questions, you can ask me in the coffee break. Okay, because we have an, one more talk after that. I don't want to delay too much. All right. Now, till now people are, we talked about all this. This is the twist I was talking about. People say, okay, then are we, aren't we just going away from this uh, batch API forever? No, there is a hope. The hope is that since the API had made sure that there is no direct connection to mini batch, there is an effort which is started few months back to come up with a runtime which is purely stream. Okay, so they have uh, started working on uh, something called as a, I think uh, streaming uh, query, something like that. I don't remember the name. Is there a name here? No. If you are more interested, uh, go to Spark 2029-28. It is an effort which is hopefully will land in 2.3, which is few weeks after now, uh, which will in the alpha, which will actually change the runtime. Now, why it is possible? Because they have changed the API now, which does not talk about the mini batch, and they can now experiment with the new runtime. And you may not be able to say, I can use it immediately, not really, but they will experiment for some time, and then you can switch over between the runtime without doing any work. That is kind of an idea what they are trying to say. So which means still, now you still do a mini batch, but you still use the same API, but when this new runtime comes along, you should be able to switch over from your mini batch execution to the real so, streaming system. So the new runtime will be for batch also? Or it will uh, no, it is for stream. Only for stream. Only for stream. So the idea of data set and data frame was kind of decouple APIs from the runtime. That was the kind of a big theme. And they have done it in the batch, which means now all the optimization, what you see, they are not in the API, it's more of in the runtime. They are going to do it in the streaming system, which means in the Spark future, the API is same, but runtime may be different. So that's what that's what Flink also does uh, these days, the same API, different runtime. Spark is also moving in that direction, but that does not mean that you cannot use the API today. You can use the API, you get a mini batch execution, but when you go to maybe a few months down the road, you still take the same program, but now run in the real streaming system. Does it make sense? So it's a kind of multi-step process. If they have done both of them together, this would have taken like two years to do the API and do the runtime. That's why they did a two-step where you can use the API with the existing runtime. Second one is they'll learn from it 
they can have a uh, streaming system. Okay. So what, what is the difference between these two, uh, like these two runtimes? Uh, latency. So this way should give a much lower latency compared to what we have today. Yeah, but Be from an implementation perspective, like what, what should be a difference between a it's a huge. Existing yeah, it's a huge. I will not go into that. I will talk maybe in the offline. It's a huge. So I have gone through the Flink internals. It's a huge work. Okay. okay. Let's move on. Oh yeah. So it took me like uh, 45 minutes to get through a first example. That's fine. So uh, you can say, okay, this looks fine as soon as possible. But what about if I want to control the batch time? Right. That's what one of the questions people are asking. So what about if I already have a DStream API, which I'm now porting to the uh, st structure streaming, can I specify that batch time so that I know exactly for how much time it's creating? And to answer that thousand rows question, it is actually time. So it will create five batches, which will go one after another. Okay, so how to do that? In uh, earlier, I told you there is no batch time. The API for that is called as trigger. So the name itself says trigger means it's a trigger for execution and that API is on the on top of query. Why it, is, why it is important? Because you can have different <coughs> queries which are running on the different speed. Right? I can have one batch which is running for 10 seconds, one running for one second. Not like earlier where everything is running on the same point of time. So let me show you an example. Still we are not doing any processing here. Uh, yeah, same, it's all the same. Yeah, here this is where you arrive. You say output mode equal to append. Uh, again, I will not talk about it. If you go to left, Let's go to that. Here you have to say trigger dot processing time. Again, we are not talked about time abstraction much, but you can say processing time is your typical D stream time, pen, and it is seconds. So here, I, what I'm talking about is, is a 10 second mini batch. I think this is more comfortable to people than uh, as soon as possible, right? Uh, but if you so, which means if you are porting your code from your D stream API to new API, you have same semantics. But it just have to be now specified in the query API. So this is the processing time, not the fetch time, right? No. So you, but if by the API, it's indicated that you can even do at the event time. But I'm not going to talk about it because we are not talking about the time abstraction. Here, this is saying whatever you used to do in the stream, if you want to do it, this is the API. Processing time, 10 seconds. So it means whatever the data you have got for last 10 seconds, process it. That's a batch for you. Can we assume that when you have not specified this value, this is by default something like one million? By second. default, it is zero. By default, zero. Zero. So zero means that just create a batch as soon as possible, and whatever else comes is <coughs> something like that. So there is no time per se. So that's why if you look at the default, it's a processing time of zero. And a resolution, I'm thinking, might not be one millisecond, maybe like a nanosecond or something. It's really, really as soon as possible. Okay. I will not run this because it's the same example. Uh, you can uh, let us move on. Yeah. Correct. So actually, the buffer is at the source level. It is not at the query level. Query is more of saying where, what time it triggers. So which means query will be like uh, setting like a thing and the buffer is done at the source level. Of course, if it is something is delayed, it will be buffering in the thing, but it's not directly tied to the query. So it may, you can say maximum of query is the buffer you get from, but not every query is maybe reading from the same source. That's also there. Maybe different uh, queries are so, it's always bound to a source, not to the query layer. So like, like example that I'm like one. Yeah. Yeah, so answer to the buffer is, so it depends upon the source. Let us say in the socket stream, the buffer is in memory. But in the Kafka, it is not the case. Kafka, it just remembers the offsets so that the, there is no really buffer per se. So what the 10 second means that it says, what is the buff, uh, offset of the zero second? And what is the offset of the 10 second? It goes and reads from the Kafka at that point of time. It does not have to remember in the memory. But the, if the stream does not have, a, or maybe the source does not have a storage, of course, it has to do in the Spark layer. So the question was, if there is a different timings, where does the data reside? Depends upon the source. If the source already has a storage, for example, Kafka, you don't need to store. It already has the data till like 
24 hours or whatever it is. But if your uh, source is, let us say, socket or if it is a, a sensor, then that buffering has to be done at the spark and it is done at the memory level. Does it make sense? Uh, when you say processing time is 10 seconds, yeah. internal thread basically launched and then uh, source every 10 seconds. It will read from a source as soon as possible. So the reading is not uh, blocked. The processing will be triggered for 10 seconds. It's similar to DC. So. Uh, that 10 seconds, that is window time basically. It's a batch time. It's a batch time in the DC MP. The difference between the window time and the batch time in the thing is, window time is something we do for processing reasons. The batch time we kind of do it for triggering purposes. That's why it's called as triggering MP. This is something I want to trigger but actual execution may be running on a 30 minutes window, which I'm defined in the program. Do you want to do, do you understand? For example, okay, let me tell you in the very high level. Let us say I'm doing the ETL and doing an aggregation. That's my thing. I want to do ETL for every 10 seconds. That is my batch time. But I want to do aggregation on last 30 minutes. That is my window. So that's how we differentiate. So when you have trigger a series, yeah. so how, how do you say as a customer, how is it visit the batch? Like, uh, <laughs> it might be after the it's on the Correct. How it decides, uh, so it says, so I am free now. I got a message. I got a batch done. Till that batch is completed, whatever else, everything else is there. That is the second batch. Uh, how, how it identifies that uh, it is, it is Yeah, the socket normally defines the new line as a separator. Okay. So again, the question was how it knows the one <laughs> message is entered. Uh, it's again a specific to source. But here, since we are reading a string, new line is the trigger. Okay. Will you present the Kafka? Uh, Kafka also same. It depends upon what you are reading. If you are reading a, a Avro or something, it will have a, an indicator which says uh, it is the end of the message or not. So it's then, a serialization. But then every single uh, tuple will become one batch. Yes. In the as soon as possible uh, thing. So that's why I'm told it's a very similar to event based processing. In the event also, it's a similar uh, abstraction layer. Of course, the execution is different, but it's the same abstraction layer. Okay. So I have to move on. I have not, not even got it to word count, right? So word count is uh, important. Now people are asking, what about uh, uh, processing? What about state? This is where I'm going to talk about it. So the example which we are going to say, till now what we did, we read from the source and we dumped it to the sink. That's all. But that's not what we do normally in the stream processing. We need to do some processing. So what I'm going to do is that everyone knows the word count, uh, what do you say, logic, right? So it has to be in dark now. So I will show you the code. Uh, I will do the explanation there itself. Now, uh, till here is same. Uh, I am getting the data. Now, what I want to do is that I want to do uh, two things. I want to take the string and split it into multiple words, and I want to do the count. Okay, that's what your program is. But if you look at the data frame API, it is not really good for doing this uh, data cleanup. Right? It is very good for doing the data querying, but it's not very good for data cleaning. So, what I am doing is that. For those operations which needs a data cleanup, I'm going to, going to use a data set API. And the one which needs the querying, I'm going to use a data frame API. And this is very typical what you do it in the batch also. If you have a data frame, you convert to data set to work with a, a map or flat map, even though you can do it in a data frame. But for the aggregation and those kind of things, you normally use SQL or here I'm using a data frame DS. Does it make sense? So if you see here, uh, I'm just importing the implicit. So I am converting the data frame into a data set which has a one column called value which has a string data type. Does it uh, make sense? Yes. This is a batch API. Then what I'll do, I run a flat map. What I'll do, I split by the space. Then I get the words. Uh, if you again see, this is a data frame API. I'll do a group by by value and do a count. Does it make sense? Then finally what I'll do is that I write it to console. Now, if you see, I have changed the output mode. I'll talk about it. Complete and I say await termination. Does the word count of this seems very similar to your typical word count? Just that now we are reading from a socket. Earlier we used to read from the file. We'll see. So we'll see. So it looks like a, maybe a batch or a single row, but does it does across the board? That's what I think the state question was. Now let us run. That's where we have to run this. Maybe something is already running earlier, right? Yeah. Did we stop it? Okay. 
let us go to the program. Let us say hello world and enter. Let us go and see what happens. Let us go up. Uh, how do you say hello and world? Okay, everyone is happy. This is actually doing the first try. Okay, now the question is what happens in the second line? Okay, uh, I will, uh, before we run it, we will uh, take a vote here. So, how many people think when you go to second line, it will reset the state? Which means it will still print hello world 1 1 or it will print 2. How many say 1? Yeah. Okay. So, let us uh, uh, run that thing. Okay, let's go to the program. <clears throat> okay, do you see that? It is a two and two. So what that means is that across the batches, we are remembering the state, right? That's what it means. So even if it's a one message, it doesn't matter. Across the batches, we are remembering the state, which is kind of a reverse of your DStream API. If you have done this in the DStream API, I will come back to you one minute. Uh, DStream API, what you will get? It will reset after the batch is completed. Okay, uh, question? Yes, because that uh, context tool, because uh, we have given a 10 seconds as a batch. No, we have not given 10 seconds here. This is uh, as soon as possible. Where is the state being maintained? Sorry? State being maintained. Okay, we'll, okay, we'll come to that. Yeah. All are able to follow? Yeah. Is that the reason why we are doing? Like each batch completes and then we start the next batch. Okay, right, that's a good question. Is that the reason why we are doing this uh, delay between the batches? All right. Now the answer to it, if let us go to slides, I should have answers on it. Right? That's where the understanding the state comes in. So in earlier APIs, DStream or Strong, state is something you build over the existing APIs. It is not built in. And when I talked about the initial, the evolution, I told you that state is much more important that to us compared to what we used to do in the stream processing earlier. So what Spark has done is, if you are doing aggregations, the state is default. You don't need to say anything. If you are doing an aggregations, it always keeps the state across the batches. What type of aggregations? Do we have any? All the data frame aggregations. Count, sum, Whatever the aggregations you do in a data frame, sorry? Only cumulative aggregations. Yeah, cumulative aggregation. Yeah, cumulative aggregation or associated aggregations. Your sum, average, all those are stateful by default. Why? Because most of the time that's what we need. Right? There's very few cases where we say, no, I don't care about the state after a batch is completed. And if I'm not thinking in terms of batch, that doesn't even make sense. Resetting of the things after a batch means what? I don't know. I don't care about batch. What I need, I want a running word count. And who has to keep the state? Let the runtime figure out. How we used to do in the DStream API, we have to call this update state by key and we have to do all that dance. In the structure streaming, what they told is, okay, you don't care about it. We will have kind of a do that for you. Make sense? So which means in structure streaming, all the aggregation, or I can even say, all the programs by default are stateful, which is kind of a reverse of DStream API, which are by default, everything is stateless, you need to introduce the state. We have an answer. So we have a next few slides on the answer to say, no, I don't like, yeah. So, uh, but if it is keeping the state right from the start, then whatever the time Okay, so the question is that if it remembers the state across the board, what happens, for example, does it lineage increases or that is the implementation detail or what about my uh, resources? Is it just going to be exploding uh, forever or if I crash, what happens? All those questions will be answered in the next few slides. Okay, but let me go one by one. Uh, now the thing is that you are talking about what is this output mode? I told you that when we did this, we did this output mode to complete. Uh, what is an output mode is, I told you that input is a table and output is a table, correct? Now what is the output mode is, what portion of table is visible to me once the batch is completed? All are able to follow what is output mode?
when you are outputting or when you are the batch is completed what portion of the data set sorry the table is visible to me is called as the output mode now there are three output modes one is append what is append means it only has a visibility to the things which have created newly in the batch does it make sense then there is a update what is that update only the things which have changed now they may be completely new or there is something already there but it's changed and there is a complete which means i have a visibility to the complete data which is done till now does it make sense uh, what are the output modes i have a slide which says but i'm just taking here now why it matters if you are doing etl you normally can use append why because most of the etl is done at the message at a time i do transformation i dump i don't have to have visibility to the complete data there are some cases where you use update i will come back to update when we do some of the programs when you need complete when you are keeping the state forever then you need a complete output right because all the keys has to be there so that if there is new data coming in that key will be get updated that's why we have to use complete so if you give up and you get an error saying that you are using an aggregation but you are giving the output mode as a append you need to use a complete for because we need to have visibility for the all the data so that's what the output mode means uh i can just so the reason is simple let us say if i'm dumping this results into a table right now it makes more sense let us say if i'm doing etl i want to append to the database correct but if, if i'm doing aggregation i want to update or i want to rewrite the whole table because maybe the new uh, aggregation i'm coming i don't want to append because there is a duplication of the thing the complete mode says take the whole thing and write it or update means only write what is changed does it make sense update yeah. has both new and updated right? yeah it's a new and updated one so yeah. is there a way that i can specify that uh, i want a complete view but yeah. uh, let's say over a day or over a week or okay. like right from the start yeah so there is a window and uh, watermarks we'll come to that so the question is that if the state is forever can i limit the state you can that's where we get into window which is not even we are touching in the, our our uh, discussion today so we are even have so many other things to talk about uh, okay what is the whole thing the whole thing is that the state management is now removed from the application code you know it is a part of the runtime which means earlier whatever the state by thing what we used to do in the application code now you don't need to do it most of the cases you get it for default if you don't want it there are one some of the use cases you can see but most of the time you need it you don't need to care about in the application code it just given from the front end and how it knows it notes from the data frame api in the data frame api if you are doing an aggregation it knows that this needs the state does it make sense to you no yes okay right. i thought i will break at uh, 12:45 i will go for few more minutes and uh, maybe have to stop or we have to stop what is the next one ah we have done this <coughs> okay so we stop i think yeah, because the one question here was uh, what if i don't care about the uh, complete state i want so one of the use cases if i'm uh, porting from d string i want this aggregation which is done for last 15 seconds let us say can i do that in the my program you can that's why it called as a stateful stateless aggregations okay we will break for 10 minutes and we'll come back okay i think sense transfer to the mic oh so then it's great i think that okay just yeah check check with them okay till that any questions i know there are a lot of questions so you can ask so me state is yeah. saved in memory and can be spilled over to us okay so the question is a, okay question is can i have a pluggable interface that i send you can yeah so the uh, okay so it's not pluggable it's just a static interface that i can send to you okay so the answer to that is there is a concept of state store uh, by default it's a memory uh, you can do it in terms of hdfs but they have a plugin uh, where you can write it to your own database or something the api is state store is it not checkpointed by default it's not checkpointed but there is a way to checkpoint okay you can plug it to a cache you can plug it to any other for example flink has something called rock db or something they plug it to those kind of thing so spark has opened up a api where by default it writes to memory if you en enable checkpointing it will write to hdfs if not you can write your own plugin which will write to a database or something else but then this uh, state will again be distributed across the yes. number of workers you have correct correct that's why it is using hdfs by default okay. so then it will ensure that uh, let's say i'm reducing then the same keys will always go to the same reducer so that it is maintained yes 
so before i get into the uh, this thing any questions you have can we have multiple states like uh, per batch state and the, the whole session state? Uh, okay so the question is can we have a, a multiple state uh, you can have because the state is kept up kept at the data frame level so you can do a one data frame for a whole data that's what we have seen an example now i will also talk about a stateless aggregation which is another data frame you can have two data frames which has a different data states we can have different states which are going across a different uh, time frame yeah so an example of that uh, the output mode append and output mode complete i will show you in this example so last time we used what complete which means every time it was getting a new thing it was showing me the complete result so i will going to show you the append in this example uh, any other questions? Fine. Now, one of the questions uh, people have asked or also is that when you keep a state, uh, there is a sum, uh, you have to pay the price of resources, correct? The state is not free. Even though it's uh, easy to maintain, it is not free, which means you need to make sure that there's a memory, disk, etc, etc. And also with the state, there comes up the burden of recovering it. So let us say, I do not care about the state. I just want to do the aggregations but I don't care about the state across the batches. Then what you do? That's what you normally used to do in the D stream. Now, how to do it in the, our uh, structure streaming. There is an API called flat map groups, which is on top of a data set API, which allows you to do that. So what we are going to see in the next example is doing a word count, which we did like last time, but using this API, which allows you to get those batch only aggregation, which was not there in the earlier. Are you able to, uh, follow which means by looking at what kind of API you are using spark makes a decision that should they use a stateful or stateless and the API for stateless aggregation is flat map groups okay let us see an example so uh, yeah just one thing so if I am using uh, uh, state operation with append mode yeah. and if I am using you can't state with append is not possible you get an error it has to be, it has to be a, or, uh, it, it is not even update, it is always complete. Update is only in few places you can use. Not all the aggregation can be update. Okay. All right. So I think till here everyone knows, right? We get the words. From here where the magic starts to happen. So I will go slowly if you come down. The first thing is that we don't use the data frame API anymore. So we used to use group by, by a string. Now we use a group by key, which is similar to your RDD API, but it's in the data set API now. So you see here that I want to group by, but what I want to group by? I want to group by by word. That is my values which I'm getting out of this. So I want to group by value. Now there is a flat map groups. So what this does, for every group, you get an iterator. All are able to follow. This is very similar to your map reduce, reduce thing. Where for every group, that's why it's called as map groups, and it also does the flattening for you. So that if there is like a nesting, it gives you flattening. And in the iterator, we'll have all the values that is uh, here, it's the values are just a string itself, like a word. Then what I'm doing, I am outputting a new iterator which has a value that is my key, my iterator of length, but this gives the count. And I'm just creating a data frame again with as uh, two things, I have to see value and count. So which means using this API, I'm telling to Spark that I'm not going to use a built-in state, which is group by by count. The reason why it is like this, because a lot of the times what we use group by and count, that is our natural thing. That is stateful. If you don't want the state, you need to change the API thing so that you are explicitly knowing that you are doing something different. Are you able to follow why it is done this way? Uh, so there is a group by and you do. And if you see here, now I can use append mode. Why? I told you that append mode says it only gives you the output for a given batch. It will forget whatever happened earlier. Complete mode means it remembers everything what was done before from the beginning of your program. So what will show the out output is you will say hello world one one. It will be forgotten when you this hello world it just say one one. It just resets every time. Does it uh, make sense? Why okay. is it named flat map groups? There is no flattening happening here. It is flattening actually in the level of uh, this iterator. So what happens is that, see, uh, let us say I have a group 
where there is in the value also there is a collection here it is not there but if it if you have a like say value let us say word and your uh, uh, values are list of 11111 then what happens for a given value there's a list 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 but it does it does the flatten across the thing so that i get out all the values as one big list does it make sense so if you have a key value pair where the value itself is a, a collection you don't need the collection to be there here because i want the, all the values to be kind of a putting in the one thing that's why there is a flat map here the flat map is not happening because our data structure is not having any nested structures so if i instead of flat map above where yeah. i'm actually splitting it on the basis of uh, space yeah. so instead of flat map i use map Correct. that will also work yeah. right so if I, if i change this set to a map then what happens is that then also you will get that uh, thing the flat map will do it for you does it make sense till yeah let us run this example because that uh, and also i given a 5 second because it helps you to differentiate otherwise uh, if it's a one by one it's leave it default so i just give a 5 seconds let us uh, give a hello world within 5 seconds twice so that we will know it is counting correctly for 5 minutes or not 5 seconds or not enter enter i don't think you can pay for it let us see ha <clears throat> it is counted right let's go over okay so it is counting for batch it's not a single message because our batch time is now 5 seconds anything which comes in 5 seconds is counted now the time is gone let us enter again no ah okay do you see that the count is reset now so now this is what the stateless is there is a state of course in just a batch but once the batch is completed the state will go away which is similar to dstream apis this can be used if you are porting your existing code to structure streaming but you don't want to use a, a state which goes for a long long time does it make sense does it also answer the append append is just what is happened in the batch complete is complete across <coughs> the batch that's what it means and if you are using the stateful thing you need to use a complete if you are using a stateless you can use append you cannot use complete the reason is that if it is a stateless there is no bound to it. the reason why it is complete in the aggregation because aggregation normally means it restricts the size of the data so ultimately that's what it comes down to right aggregation normally says it may be few thousand rows but if it is there is no aggregation does it any do they have any limit no so that's why they say don't use a complete when there is no aggregation even though your data is limited you, you know it program will not know it so they will not allow you to use a complete if there is no aggregation but where uh... I mean, you said that update cannot be used at all the places. Some, uh, so I will not talk about that also. I will talk about in the window API because <laughs> there are no examples where I can use update. But there are some cases in the window where I can use update. Okay. Any other questions? Are you able to follow? Okay. Now you can say why API flat map goes. What is the difference? The difference is that one of the when I was discussing group by, someone told it's a cumulative. or we also call it associative data which means i can take in any order it will work but the flat map is normally slower than group by and count because it does not support something called partial aggregations what is a partial aggregation it's a combiner in your map reduce where it will aggregate something and it in the map stage and it will do the reduce that is only possible if you have associative kind of a nature of your aggregation if it is not then you cannot do partial aggregation and since in the flat map groups gives you iterator it does not know what you are doing inside that so it will not can do the partial aggregation for you so that's why normally flat map groups is slower but it does not matter because we are normally do it in the one batch at a time right even if it is slower it's just for that batch the batch is very small we are fine but make sure that you don't do like a big batch as where you say okay i am waiting for a uh, some time and i'm doing some aggregation then flat map group is not a good uh, thing that's the one thing second one is that flat map group can be used only with the append it cannot be used with a complete because it uh, it is a stateless you cannot have a, a complete mode and flat map groups needs grouping done using a data set api not a data frame api because that flat map groups is only there in the data set which has a group by key so i told you that is the difference there is a group by which is a data frame api and group by key which is a data set api <coughs> the reason i am saying all these things is when you first do coding it will go all over your head so what is this data frame api data set api but this feature is actually part of the data set not part of the data frame that's why you need to be switching between these so 
idea is that most of the people like to use data frame most of the people want stateful you get it for free you don't need to do any extra work if you really want stateless then you need to do the extra work which is reverse of dstream api where by default i will get stateless if i need a stateful i need to do the extra work that's it oh yeah i don't know whether it is out of context but yeah. how is lineage graph no, it's the same as your data frames. It's the same thing. No, in the scenario where it is uh, stateless and... Ah, in the stateless, the data frame will be forgotten. So, when there is a stateless, after the batch is done, there is nothing is remembered. There is no state at all. There is no lineage concept. When there is a state, of course, the all the lineage and all the caching, everything comes into picture. So, think that after batch, the data frame is lost. No more references to it. In the statefulness, of course, that... Again, the lineage is not same as your typical lineage. Uh, there is some more difference between it, but yeah, so there is uh, there is something remembered when there is a state. Okay, does it make sense? Ah, right. ah. Till now, uh, we were talking about all the state, state, state. Uh, but sometimes our program like uh, crashes, right? Maybe some reason. Now the question is, what happens to the state? Uh, by default, you will lose the state, but you can easily enable the checkpointing which will write the state into the disk, normally uh, HDFS based file system, so that when you come back, it will recover. Again, this also part of the query API, which means you can have some processing which is stateless and you don't care about the state, or maybe some state you can you do not care at all. There can be some queries which, which you want to checkpoint. <coughs> that is up to you to decide what needs to be checkpointed or what does not need to be checkpointed. I'll just show you an example. It's uh, not too difficult for say. Yeah, so <clears throat> oh, am I using a file stream here? Right. Uh, do not care about the first few examples because I am going to come back to the uh, state, uh, I mean the file. Only look at this one. When you write a query, now you can give this extra option called as checkpoint location, which uh, is, I am here giving a slash TMP, but uh, in your uh, typical thing, it can be a HDFS path. What it will do is that when this query started, it first goes and looks at here. Does the checkpointing exist? If it is, then it will recover from it. Uh, if not, it will uh, write. And also there's a time you can configure. That's the checkpointing time. How frequently you want to checkpoint, similar to Restream API. I don't know what is the by default, maybe a second or two. It will keep on writing into the disk. Does it make sense? Ah. But you can still lose, I mean, it cannot be real time that it's checkpointing also and then uh, so it's always a between single failure will result in like some state getting lost. There is a possibility. There is a possibility. So there is a possibility that you have checkpointed uh, after something happened, but you were not checkpointed in between. Normally that is uh, solved using a, a read time. So what is a checkpoint? Normally let us say take an example of Kafka. Checkpoint also remembers till what offset I have read. So when you come up, you will rerun some of the processing for the things which you already done but not checked. So we will not get a wrong result, but of course there is an extra processing need to be done. Okay, but it will take care of that. Thing. Yeah, it will take care. Given Give that the source is, uh, what do you say, it has a storage. Yeah, yeah. No, I so. think it's not uh, that much well solved because uh, it can happen that, uh, so there are two modes, right? From yeah. Kafka, you acknowledge as soon as you read or you acknowledge once you are done. So okay. there is still certain chance that... No, uh, we are not keeping it in the Kafka. No, no, you are saying that we are storing the state. So, Source. So, uh, so basically, whatever the state, we yes. are saving it. Correct. But you either are you dumping that offset also that I am also dumping the offset into the HDFS. Okay. So I am not depending upon the Kafka to do the so, state management. I so I remember it what I have read, and if I lose, uh, I was read, but I was not. Uh, then the actual correct thing, I will just remove I that, think, right? I think, I think yeah. that lineage from source will remain. Yeah. So that if you lose some chunk which was not checkpointed, yeah. that lineage can be used to. Yes. So I, so it. normally in the Kafka lineage is the offset. So I remember like till what offset I read, then from there I'll uh, continue. Okay. Checkpointing will uh, will not go in line with your utmost consumption. Uh, it will work with uh, utmost uh, in terms of the results. See, that's the, that's the difference. At most, it's not uh, uh, in terms of the processing, but the results you will get, uh, no, not at most, even exactly once. You will get exactly once, but not in terms of processing. All right. Now, the final section of the discussion, what I wanted to do was two things. One is, 
how to work with the files there was a question someone asked me that till now we have talked with the socket stream i don't even have an example of kafka here so we will come later uh, so i am going to talk about how to work with the files also i am going to talk about how to do a batch join uh, because let us say i am uh, streaming a sales data now i have to enrich that data with the customer uh, uh, information how you do that in the structure stream so these are the two examples uh, i am going to talk about let us start so uh, one of the nice thing about uh, spark streaming even in the gstream api they had a good support for uh, files which means i can treat a folder as a stream and as and when there is a new files comes in i can uh, use it as a stream which is very useful for people who are moving from batch system to a streaming system because now i don't need to change my source right so they have the same thing uh, it supports the file type like csv json parquet out of the box what is the file type it means that if you given a schema it will do the parsing for you you don't need to read it as a text file and do the all the parsing from yourself if you just say parquet it will know how to read it if you say json it will uh, do it for you the uh, only thing is that the schema inferences is not supported which means it will not look at your csv and figure out what is the type of thing you need to specify the schema how to do that i will show you in an example and what is the stream here means picking up the new files if you update the existing file it will not pick up it will look at the modified time or normally in the stf it is a creation time and depending upon that time it will pick up the new files inference can be done for parquet right uh, it will not do actually so the api itself says you need to give a schema it can be done but they will not do it the reason is simple if you have a two parquet file which has a schema differently so that inference will become a problematic so okay let us see an example file stream example all right so the first uh, the first thing is same now this is where i'm uh, i'm reading the csv actually so it has a uh, four fields uh, there is a transaction id i think i may have an example csv so our famous this files stream can also be idfs or s3 files or yeah any hdfs uh, supported system which is hdfs local file system s3 s3 will be s3 also will be used okay. it is a, it is called as hdfs compatible system which has like 14 different file systems okay. all right so this is my file this is used like last five years now so transaction id customer id item id and amount paid and there are like four fields think that this is my stream which is uh, coming in the every uh, file let us go to the program file stream yeah. now this is same uh, right now here I have an option where i uh, wait, this is where i define the schema this is very similar to your batch api schema definition this is nothing new uh, here i says function read stream now i can say header equal to true what that means is that it will look for is the first line is header or not uh, if, let us say if the first file has a header and next files are not have header it will figure out and it will not uh, kind of say okay there is no header i will go to uh, thing or things but most of the time there is a possibility that every file you are putting in the folder has a header you want to make sure that you do not read it so you can set it equal to true which is very similar to your batch api schema this is where i plug in the schema so that i know what is the schema and this is uh, here i am saying i am reading a csv right split by comma all those kind of options and this is a folder where it access the stream so slash tmp input will be uh, my stream and as and when there is new files i'll pick up and i'll execute does it make sense ah. so with header equal to do it will chop off the first line of every file right? yes yes and but one uh, yeah so uh, then you do append i am not doing anything here but it looks very similar to your socket stream only thing you are going is that you have to specify schema because source does not tell you the schema second one is that you are giving a folder uh, rather than the uh, typical stream and also you have support for csv json parquet etc etc so in this example you are not uh, taking advantage of anything related to schema no right so is it mandate to specify a schema yes so if you don't have a schema you cannot create a data frame so you they support every design uh not built in as far as i know so mm -hmm. because they have parke and other things so they may not have that but there is a third party library which yeah, you can yeah. use okay so that is that now the final thing is that joining with the static data so what i have shown you is how to do the file as a stream now the question is no i am not looking for a file as a stream think like i have a socket stream which has this sales data coming in and i have a customer uh, file which has this customer names or customer details now what i want to know when the sales team comes in 
I want to know who is the customer, who is buying, what is their address, etc, etc. Now what has happens, customer data is the static data and your, uh, there is a sales data is a stream data. How you combine these two? Normally in the stream processing, it is called as enrichment, data enrichment using a uh, data, uh, sorry, uh, static data. So it is very easy in the uh, structure streaming because both of them are using the data set API. Right? So both of them have same abstraction, I can easily join. So uh, let me say an example. So yeah, uh, I'm creating these two case classes which helps me to do the schema definition. So there is multiple ways to create a schema in uh, uh, data frame. This is one of the way. So I have uh, four fields and in the customer, there is only two fields, customer ID and customer name. And uh, customer ID and customer ID are common. I can join on top of it. Uh, let us show a customer.csv file. All right, so I just have one John Clark Michael sample. So there is nothing much here. Yeah, if you see, the first thing is that I am reading a stream here. This is my soccer stream. But if you see the next one, I am not using a read stream, I am using a read. Do you see that? So they are different. This is a stream, <coughs> this is a batch, but in the same program. Both gives me what? A data frame. Right? One is a streaming data frame, one is a thing. How I can join? Uh, I think I'm doing some cleanup here. I'm just converting that uh, socket into a sales. So here, I've, if you see, I have not given a schema there, but I'm putting a schema after the fact. So I'm just saying, just take a socket and just put a string, then you pass it and then make it as a schema. Then how to do a join? It's simple, you say sales DS, which is a, uh, coming as a stream from the socket. There's a customer DS, which is coming as a batch uh, data set. Do a join and you can write it as a uh, append. So it is not an aggregation, you can write it as an append. Does it make sense? That's it. So there is nothing special here. So can we not join two stream here? I'll come back to that. Uh, are you able to follow? Right, there is nothing special. You read a, one a data frame from the file, you create another data frame from a stream. You can naturally join using the join API of the data frame. What it do is that it will join and give the results. Till now, all are able to follow. Now, here the problem is very simple because my batch data never changes. It always the same, it's like a lookup table and the stream as a can mean I'll just look up the thing and I enrich. Now, what is the question you may be having? What about stream joins? And what if, if I have both of them coming up as a stream, can I do a join? As of today, Structure streaming does not support stream joins. Okay, as of today, because it is a much more complicated because there is a like a late event, there is a delays, so many things. So as of now, stream joins are not supported in the structure stream. Okay. So in yeah. the batch one, it keeps it in memory as a lookup table? Not by default, not by default. You can cache it if you like it, but by, by default it's not kept in memory. It's just reading from the file as and when you read it. So in the next session, I will be covering how we are doing the stream join. Okay, stream join. Okay, that's good. Okay, so that completes our uh, brief introduction to the structure stream. The reason I say brief, it's not in terms of time. I told you we can do a window without a time also. So the window is the number of topics. So we just covered the very beginning of structure streaming. What we have not touched is the whole concept of window and time, which itself is a big topic where it we say processing time, event time, ingestion time, multiple different windows, sessionization, so there are a huge amount of topics. But uh, hopefully, I think you guys got, got the gist of what is a structure of streaming and how it's much different than what you have seen in your Spark streaming and how it inlines with the new generation of uh, streaming system. That's kind of overall idea. So Spark has to be competitive enough to compete with Flink or any of the new system coming out. So if you want a reference, I wrote a lot of blog series on the same topic, you can go through it. There is a nice blog series from Databricks which talks about the, this new structure streaming. They talk about through Kafka, you can uh, go through it. And a uh, lot of the ideas came from Fling. So uh, I was reading through the Fling uh, documentation to understand a lot of these topics. So you can also go through the Fling. Yeah, I think that's all. Uh, I will just give two minutes. Any questions? Are I able to follow? Okay, that's all guys.